Uh, so welcome everyone. My name is Karen King. I am the Community Affairs Liaison for the Office of New Haven Affairs. Our office hosts a monthly community breakfast on the first Thursday of the month uh, during the academic year. Uh, for the time being, uh, we are holding our uh, meetings via Zoom. Uh, do we get a little little bit of a better read on the rising COVID situation? Uh, so thank you for joining us um, virtually, and hope we hope to see you in person soon. Uh, I have a few minute, a uh, few announcements before we get started, and I am going to share my screen. And all of the information that I'm sharing with you uh, will be uh, dropped into the chat as well. Uh, so. Uh, the university, now that we're back on campus, we are we have an, um, a proliferation of events that you're welcome to join us um, throughout this month and the rest of the academic year. Uh, a small sampling, there's a screening of my octopus teacher um, in, on Wednesday, September 13th at 4 p.m. at the Humanities Quadrangle on York Street. Uh, there's also a post-film discussion with the co-director, Pippa Ehrlich. So it's a great uh, time for you to come in, see the movie in person, and get to uh, talk about the experience with the co-director. Next, the Wyndham Campbell Prizes were announced last year. These are prizes uh, that award $175,000 to um, to uh, authors, uh, writers, and this is an unrestricted grant for them to use. As you can imagine, it's a it's quite a windfall in recognition of their talent, and it really helps them to continue to do the good work that they're doing. Uh, we have a festival every year on campus that celebrates these authors. Uh, this will take place on September 19th through 22nd. There are a ton of free events that will be taking place to celebrate the authors who are pictured here. The events start at 5 p.m. on Tuesday on College Street with a welcome party and continue for the next few days. So I really encourage you all to come out and join some, if not all of the um, events to celebrate um, their work. And lastly, on September 30th, we will have the second annual Harmony Classic football game. If you joined us at last year's Harmony Classic football game, you saw uh, a great game, but also a wonderful halftime uh, show between um, Yale and HBCU who joined us. Uh, this year, Morgan State will be playing at the Yale Bowl against um, the Yale Bulldogs. Uh, the event starts from 10 to noon with the Hospitality Village near the right outside of the Yale Bowl. And at 10 of 12, there will be the procession onto the uh, field and the game starts at noon with the halftime uh, Halftime performances by the Yale Precision Marching Band and the Morgan, and Morgan State University's band. So uh, please join us. I will drop links in the chat so that you can um, buy tickets and join us. Now on to our wonderful speaker. Dr. Daniel Sarpong is a senior research scientist in the Department of General Internal Medicine and the executive director of the Office of Health Equity Research. A trained biostatistician, he is passionate about using his work to address health disparities as well as engaging with the community. Dr. Sarpong was drawn to statistics as an undergraduate studying mathematics at Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. His interest in studying health disparities came later while at Jackson State University in Mississippi, where he served as research professor with the School of Health Sciences. Senior biostatistician, uh, you know, I practiced biostatistician five times before I came on this morning. Senior biostatistician with RCMI Trans Translational Research Network Coordinating Center and Associate Director of the Center of Environmental Health. There, he became involved with the Jackson Heart Study, the largest single-site epidemiology study looking at the causes and progression of cardiovascular disease in African-Americans. The study opened his eyes to the disparities that underrepresented groups in, in, me in medicine face. He became determined not only to research this problem, but also to find a way to mitigate those disparities in pursuit of health equity. After more than a decade at Jackson State, Sarpong moved to Xavier University of Louisiana. We served as endowed chair and director of the Center for Minority Health and Health Disparities Research and Education for eight years. 
before coming to Yale to lead the Office of Health Equity Research and continuing to work toward achieving health equity. Please help me welcome Dr. Sarpong. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Sarpong. Thank you, Ms. Kim, and thank you all. Uh, good morning, and I hope that uh, this presentation, you'll find it very useful. And at the end of the day, uh, it's all about collaboration and working with communities. So at this point, I'll share my screen and uh, dive right into the presentation. And I'm hoping that we'll have a robust conversation at the end. Uh, so um, be engaged uh, so I can learn more from you and uh, at least with what I also share. So I'll go ahead and do that at this moment. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay. So the, the focus of the uh, presentation this morning is to really talk about uh, Yale School of Medicine, the Office of Health Equity Research. Uh, but at, but in talking about the office, we really want to underscore uh, the need to foster community academic research collaboration. We know that that's the only way we can really move the needle in the right direction when it comes to health uh, equity. Uh, so uh, to sort of give you a roadmap of the presentation, I want to start off by level setting by giving a definition of health equity, uh, give you an overview of the office, talk a little bit about some of the uh, community engaged uh, signature initiatives that we uh, involved in and uh, planning to embark on. And part of why we're sharing this is also that as members of the uh, community that you find yourself in ways that you can be engaged in some of these initiatives. Uh, so hopefully that you see yourself at least in one or two of them. And we definitely want to welcome you and to engage you uh, in this work that uh, we're doing. Uh, we also want to talk about means by which we're um, disseminating information because it's very, very important that uh, all that we learn, uh, that knowledge is shared so that those who need it the most can get it in ways that uh, make sense to them also. So we're looking at different modalities in terms of the dissemination. And then I'll conclude with some summary and future directions. Uh, so when we think about health equity, what we're saying is that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. And this requires removing all obstacles to health, such as poverty, discrimination, and their consequences, including powerlessness, and lack of access to good jobs with fair pay, quality education, housing, safe environment, and health care. So when you look at the cartoon, you find on the top part, it speaks more to equality. And sometimes people confuse equity with equality. Equality means you give everybody the same. But because our needs are different, if we're to achieve our optimum uh, health, everyone has to have some customized resource or the resources have to be different and has to fit our needs. So equity means that some people get the regular size bikes, some get small bikes, and even some have greater fitted uh, type of bikes. So this is what we mean by equity. Everybody doesn't get the same, but people get what they need to be able to achieve uh, their best health. And so that's the objective of health equity. Uh, for us to be able to achieve this, the office basically employs a health equity lens to facilitate and promote community academic partnership to address community priorities. We think this is very, very important uh, because we have to work with community. Uh, researchers may have the technical skills, community have the lived experience, and at the end of the day, they have to be part of what uh, comes out as solutions so that we all own the solution. It also serves as a hub for health equity research at Yale School of Medicine. So, uh, and our work is really cent the centering community um, and it, in a way that is foundational to achieving health equity research excellence. So the schematic on the right side talks about the overlapping role of communities, health, the health system, and the Yale School of Medicine. 
And at the center of it is the goal of achieving health equity. These relationships have to be bi-directional in nature, where there's uh, uh, communication between communities and the health systems. And in this case, we're looking at Yale New Haven Health Systems and the Cancer Center. And then there's also has to be communication and um, conversation between the School of Medicine and the health system so that the knowledge exchange would actually help drive the research that is needed and also to improve the healthcare delivery system. And then the School of Medicine with its researchers also have to have this bi-directional relationship and communication with community so that the research that we are performing at the school is actually relevant and does solve an immediate problem of the community so that the research projects are actually a high priority uh, health needs of the community. And we feel that with this kind of model that at least we'll be able to move uh, the needle in the right direction. Uh, we have a wonderful team and we're led by an illustrious leader, uh, Dr. Marcellus Nunez-Smith. Uh, she's the associate dean uh, of the office. Um, and uh, these are my other colleagues. Uh, we work very well. Uh, we have folks who are right in, in the community, uh, making sure that we have the right force with the community and also that our work um, is informed by community needs and we are also able to relate their information. Uh, so um, um, I'm blessed to be part of this uh, outstanding team. So some of the uh, OHER supports, we support several uh, signature community engagement initiatives and I'll sort of talk uh, about those um, in a few, uh, but we're talking about the steering committee on community engagement research. Uh, we've also, about over a year ago, started an initiative called the Community Health Equity Accelerator. Uh, we've had Community Research Innovation Summit, uh, the Health Equity Community Visit and Scholar Program, Community Research Fellowship Program, and um, a more recent Community Engagement Consultant Network. Um, and I'll give you a little more detail of the one. So when we talk about the Steering Committee on Community Engagement, this is a group that has been around for a long time. It's actually uh, co-led by Ms. Natasha Ray, uh, who's the director of Healthy Starts, um, and then uh, illustrious leader, Dr. Marcellus Smith. smith uh, The group was established in uh, 05. It has over 25 members. And it still has retained uh, over 80% of its inaugural members. This group meets monthly, uh, very active subcommittees. Uh, they've really been engaged in over 35 research projects, uh, some of which are listed. We have uh, the Project Access of New Haven. Uh, there's also been uh, projects, uh, two projects that positively helped over 1,500 patients. Uh, out of that work, there's been over 20 peer-reviewed manuscripts. This is very important because we're able to get the word out in terms of what we're doing and what kind of impact we're having. There have been four uh, yearly YCCI tra uh, trainees, uh, presentation meetings, um, really work with over uh, approximately 60 postdoctoral uh, fellows, uh, junior faculty who are trained in the Center of uh, um, Community Engagement um, Research. And basically leading to over 20 million in external extramural funding. Uh, so this group is well represented by community people in the uh, 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 collaborating institutions, being academic institutions, the health system. And so we do have a good sense of what is going on in community. And the community voice is actually at the table through this um, the membership of this uh, committee. Uh, so the next one is the Community Health Equity Accelerator. Uh, the, uh, the this uh, program was designed with the notion, with the guiding principle that uh, we will look at community identified priorities. Uh, it's community uh, led by a guiding coalition, which is uh, uh, 
uh, has membership well uh, from the community. Uh, the model is designed so that we have an accelerated implementation and evaluation of community policy and clinical metrics. And also we have institutional resource commitment. Uh, the model here is that um, we start off with a community identify health need. Uh, the community guiding coalition, which is led by community leaders, um, and in this case, our coaches are uh, Amos uh, Smith and uh, Virginia Spell. Uh, they, uh, with the rest of the members uh, working with our technical team, uh, we, des we designed the metrics that we need to see, uh, we need to be able to assess. Uh, this has to relate to community policy and clinical metrics. And then from there, we look at a multi-level intervention. Uh, the reason why we have to look at the intervention in a multi-level phase as opposed to a single level phase is that we know that a lot of the single models, uh, level interventions work. They've been proven to work, but uh, we're still not getting the impact that we need. So with a multi-level approach, we believe that we'll be able to at least uh, make more impact in addressing that condition. The first uh, disease area of interest uh, that came out of the steering committee uh, as a priority need of the community in the New Haven area was pediatric asthma. And we sort of advanced that process uh, by the first launch in Chia, we've done the metrics and the multi-level intervention has been identified. Uh, we've uh, produced uh, RFA uh, request for proposals. We have three teams now that have been selected and we're in the process of um, beginning to uh, embark on our pilot project, which will last for a year. And then this is again, like an accelerated mode. And the idea is that with the intervention testing, if it proves to be successful, then we'll seek um, additional funding, external funding to scale it up. Uh, and if it doesn't succeed, we'll basically uh, de-implement it and then uh, move on to uh, our next phase. Uh, so here again, what we do have is that uh, we uh, currently in that process for the first, uh, Overlapping, that is our second cycle, which um, the committee has, the guiding coalition has identified mental health as an area of focus. And so we're currently working on that and refining that idea and then right, uh, be moving into the metrics and the multi-level intervention phase. Uh, we have uh, a broad representation of lead partners at the Community Foundation of Greater New Haven, uh, Yale New Haven Health Systems and the Yale School of Medicine. And so, uh, and we have definitely community members represented uh, through our guiding coalition who serve as designers and decision makers. We felt that for us to really make impact, uh, we needed to have community in the driver's seat. So that's the way this model has been structured. Uh, uh, next, uh, we will talk about our Community Research Innovation uh, Summit called CRIS. And here we've had actually uh, two uh, key um, uh, summits uh, focusing on biorepository research. Uh, the second one was in January 19th of this year. Uh, we spent almost half a day uh, with community members and experts across the country to bring uh, minds together in terms of how we can improve um, biorepository science, uh, particularly from the standpoint of Yale. Uh, the reason why this is important is that our society and medicine is moving into precision or personalized medicine. And we feel that representation of diverse population in terms of biorepository, it's going to be very key uh, because if the you know, technology and the uh, medical modalities that we develop does not represent the people, then those would not work for those when they actually in time of need of care. So we felt that this was very important. 
Uh, the key node address focus on embedding equity and engagement in biorepository science. Uh, we had a panel discussion on, uh, which was titled Our Road to Today's Biorepository Summit. Uh, there were three areas that we focused on, data use governance uh, and stewardship strategies to increase community engagement. There were over 50 people who attended. Uh, this was a mix of individuals. Uh, part of our, uh, our goal with this is at the end of the day to develop a guidance guidance document for research and community members to inform this work. Uh, so we've also embarked as a recommendation from the summit uh, to have community listening sessions. And that's why we've had two of them. June 7th, we had it in New Haven. Uh, August of 20, uh, 29th, we were in Bridgeport and we're currently planning on a third. Uh, listening session. These listening sessions are very important to us because we really want to hear community uh, stands on this, their experiences, their concerns, uh, their questions, so that we can dialogue and come up with solutions that make sense to all of us. Um, again, that's uh, part of what our goal is. Um, so the next, um, oops, sorry. Uh, the next. Um, initiative is the Community Research Fellows. And this is also a very, making great strides. Uh, currently, the focus has been with cancer, uh, but there is the goal to expand it to other disease areas. But just to give you some progress highlights, uh, the initial curriculum was funded by PCORI. Uh, we've increased from about nine fellows each year to 22, uh, nine fellows involved in nine projects to 22 projects. Uh, to date, we've had about 43 fellows across three cohorts that have been placed in uh, within uh, 23 of the Yale Cancer Center labs. Four of the fellows have been hired to continue the collaboration. So we can also see this as a pipeline in terms of bringing the community who is interested in research into the field of employment. Uh, one fellow is leading a manuscript. Nine fellows have joined the um, uh, Yale Cancer Center Community Advisory Board. Again, making sure that the community voice is at the table. Uh, to date, the fellows have come mainly from New Haven and Bridgeport. But as we'll see in our next uh, sets of bullets, uh, in 2024, we're hoping uh, we, the intention is to uh, recruit folks from Hartford, um, again, knowing that the whole state is our catchment area. In 2025, uh, we're looking at expanding uh, to uh, Green, uh, Greenwich and uh, Stanford uh, and having about 25 research teams annually. Uh, by 2029, the hope is that we will celebrate uh, with about 20 research labs and have over about 80 community members throughout Connecticut. Uh, but I think it, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, sort of echo some of what um, some of the fellows have said. And in one of the captions, which we're sharing with you today, is that in our group, everyone was passionate about the work for their own reasons. And this experience has been specially rewarding. I have felt very fortunate to have had a seat at the table, both literally and figuratively. So I think this really sums it all up, the impact uh, this program is having and the fact that community voice is at the table and we're doing everything we can to ensure that continues to happen. Uh, visiting Community Scholars Program, we felt that it's also an important way of really fostering this academic community partnership. The aim of this initiative was to, is to strengthen bridges to communities, gain community perspective on research, advance investigative research through community partnership, again, centering community in the work that we do. We've been truly uh, blessed and honored to have Ms. Natasha Ray as our inaugural scholar. Uh, most of you know um, uh, Ms. Ray and her work in, in the greater New Haven area, so she needs no introduction. 
but just to highlight some of the program um, uh, things that have gone on, this program basically has a three to six months affiliation. And the reason why we gave it this much time is because we want to provide opportunity for long-term projects, uh, such as maybe doing pilot projects or engaging in the researches and developing some programs that would be impactful for the community and embeds an understanding of capacity of community members. Uh, with under the inaugural uh, scholars uh, goal is to host the maternal health summit in the community, uh, partner with the national clinician uh, uh, scholars program. And currently she's working with one of the scholars, Michael Mensa, who's doing work with our young men through the barbershop focusing on fatherhood, stress, and mental health. And I was fortunate to hear some of the initial uh, results coming from this work, and it's, uh, it's very fascinating. Um, uh, participating as co-discussant the student research. Um, uh, uh, research day is also very important. Uh, our student researchers get to get insights from community leaders who are really making uh, an impact in the area of community uh, health equity. And presenting at the um, Equity uh, Research and Innovation Center team time. Um, so again, this is one of the programs we're extremely excited about. Uh, community Engagement Consultant Network. Uh, this is an, a much newer initiative. Um, uh, the overarching goal here is to engage the expertise of community members through their lived experience in advancing health equity research from concept to dis dissemination at Yale School of Medicine. The potential role of our consultants and here with our goal is to enroll uh, community members who really want to be engaged in research and inform research as consultants. Um, so here they will share uh, if some of the things, potential roles would be to share experience and wisdom to inform research design implementation and dissemination. Serve as members of community advisory boards or patient advisory boards, uh, participate in rapid um, focus group discussions in the development of the grant application. This is very important because sometimes as researchers, uh, we need input from community uh, uh, members with, with experience. So being able to talk to a few people to inform the work and actually the development of the proposal is really key. So that could be an area also that folks could serve. And share experiences as testimonials and educating others about health and research. What are some of the benefits to community in which community relevance of our future health research. Um, our intended goal is to start uh, the enrollment process uh, this year, um, next month. Uh, again, we talked about the need for dissemination and communicating um, findings from either research or best practices with the community. So there are several ways that uh, we're looking at this. Uh, we don't believe that we only have to do it through scientific publication. That's important. But we felt that there's a need to be able to summarize these research discoveries and findings into what we're calling lay summaries. And so these are community reviewed, uh, the, the English and Spanish. Um, we also embed on the uh, QR codes to make it easy for people to access the information. So that, leftmost part of the screen are uh, samples of some of those that have been developed. This, most of this work has come out of the Cancer Center, uh, working with our office, and uh, we intend to expand this uh, beyond just the area of cancer. Uh, it's also very important to be able to get on the uh, airwaves uh, and reach folks. Uh, so Tom Ficklin, uh, radio show and the radio armor uh, 690 AM have been uh, ways that in the past we communicated, and we know that a lot of conversation went on during the peak of the epidemic, um, so those are a few uh, captions. Uh, we also have been very engaged in on the national level in terms of really trying to uh, 
make an impact in terms of COVID. We all know uh, Dr. Nunez Smith's role on the national platform with COVID, uh, uh, but we also have uh, contributed into this uh, publication called The State of Black America uh, uh, and COVID-19, where the uh, members of our team were able to provide leadership in uh, developing this document, which is really informing and educating folks about what was going on with uh, COVID and uh, Black America. So in summary, I wanted to sort of talk about the fact that health equity can only be achieved by centering partnership with community, deep community and gay stakeholder partnerships, strengthens health equity research initiatives um, and dissemination of research programs and partnership within community is also very essential. Some of our future initiatives is our community engagement research studios where we bring uh, community members as expert panels and basically begin to advise and wait even on some of the research ideas uh, that our researchers may have and to really guide and uh, inform how uh, the research is designed, implemented, and disseminated. We're also looking at a community and case certification for investigators uh, so that investigators really understand ways and methods by which uh, they can effectively engage community so that jointly we can move the needle in the right direction. Uh, research 101 training for community-based organization is important. This is a way that we build capacity so that um, community-based organizations that are doing wonderful work in the community will have the capacity to attract uh, more resources to do the work that they're doing. So this would help uh, build capacity in that area. Um, and I think that does it. So thank you for your time, your patience. If you need to communicate with us, uh, you can email us as oha at yield.edu. So I'll pause at this point. I'll take my slide down and um, entertain any questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Sarpong. I, uh, so we do have time for questions. You can raise your hand and I'll call on you. You can, uh, you have the ability to unmute yourself. You can just ask your question or you can drop your question or comments in the chat. Professor Wan said when you give a talk and don't get any questions, you either did a lousy job or <laughs> everything was very clear. So yeah, I don't know which one it is, but I uh, guess on the right side. Yeah. I think any comments, any advice, um, any thoughts? I mean, it doesn't have to be a question, it could be comments or based on what we shared. Uh, ways that you all think we could do, be doing a um, much better job. Um, so I think there may have been a couple uh, things posted in the chat. And go ahead. I have I have a question if it's all right. Sure. Great. Good, good morning. Thank you so much for a um, very informative talk. I'm Karen DeBois Walton. I run Elm City Communities, which is the public housing authority for the city of New Haven. And so much of the um, information you're sharing intersects with work that we're doing. And, and certainly we know housing and security is a big factor in health equities. I'm, I'm interested in whether you have housing providers as part of your community um, uh, and uh, com committees on any of these and um, how, to, how to connect, if, there, if that is a gap, how to connect you with some people on our team. Uh, I think um, an off the top of my head, um, I may not be able to cite, but I know like with um, Emma Smith's um, uh, organization does something with housing. I, I don't think housing is the focus, so we do get some input from there. Uh, with she, uh, one of the areas that we're also looking at is housing issues that relates to asthma and making sure that improvement in the housing conditions, particularly people are renting, 
uh, we are addressing that that need. So they're definitely uh, we're in that space. Uh, are we there enough? I'm, I couldn't really tell, but we would definitely welcome conversation and see maybe how we can develop maybe some targeted uh, uh, initiatives that may address that particular issue as it intersects with health equity. Uh, definitely welcome us having. Wonderful. Some, I'll leave my contact in the in the chat, and if anyone wants to follow up, that would be great. Thank yeah, you again. We will. we will. Thank you. And we do have a question in the chat from Larice Grant, who is asking, "How can community leaders assist?" So on um, a very similar note. Oh, okay. So I think one would be um, definitely. You can reach out to us and we can definitely engage in conversations as to maybe ways that we can work with the organizations. Um, seeing that there's also a big need, we can maybe organize something where we can actually bring a group of organizations uh, with an interest to really um, begin to have dialogue in terms of how we can work collaboratively together. Uh, um, so that would be my um, initial uh, response to the question. Uh, there are also some of these initiatives that we're putting forth. Uh, two of our gentlemen, uh, Jose the uh, the the Isis, uh, and Maurice uh, Williams uh, are also at touch points uh, individuals. So. Um, we, they can also follow up, and we can we can we meet every week to talk about uh, ways that we can engage the community. So we can definitely uh, um, uh, look at uh, working through that uh, mechanism. And I see Jose has put his email uh, in the chat, so we can reach out to him and Maurice, um, and then we can uh, have some further conversations. Um, Thank you. Uh, Ms. Shaw. Um, this has been informative, but I'm curious. When we're talking about um, going out in, into the communities uh, you know, to get your research so that you can, um, you know, you can come up with results that are more representative of, uh, of, of the populations when we're talking communities, they are so communities are so reluctant to volunteer to do anything. What strategies do you have that might, you know, that might help in terms of trying to get people to raise their hand and say, okay, I'll try? Uh, that's an excellent question. There is no one particular strategy. Uh, mm -hmm. We're always learning about what is the best way to reach different uh, segments of our population. But I think it comes from community realizing that there's a genuine uh, need and a way to a need to establish relationship. It all comes down to relationship. Uh, we should be open to answer questions. Mm -hmm. We don't have to rush the process, sometimes it takes a little while. So being patient, getting the information, uh, educating one another, because there, there are things we need to learn and maybe there are things we need to share with community. So being open and just having that frank dialogue and established relationship, I think it's key. Um, and so being present, uh, you know, that's why the work of Jose and Maurice is very important. They are always in the community. People know them. Uh, you know, they have the credibility factor. Um, you know, so I think being present in the community, um, being willing to answer people's question, I think it's important. Sometimes people say no, not because they just don't want to do it. Sometimes the no means I need more information. So mm -hmm. if we don't take time to answer the questions, then they're not going to participate. And sometimes the person who resists the most might be your greatest recruiter down the road. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you just have to be patient and just talk to the person, answer mm -hmm. all their questions. And some may still not do it, which is okay. You know, which is okay. I mean, when we work with the Jackson Heart Study, we recruited 5,364 
over three and a half years. It wasn't easy. There was one community we sent over 250 letters and we only had four people recruited in one year. Wow. We decided to embark on the community engagement. We were in the community. We met with business leaders. We met with the mayor. We did all kinds of things. Fast forward a year later, we recruited over 280 people who traveled 20 miles each way wow. to do a study that took four and a half hours of their day. So it makes sense to really be in. Uh, the, the, when community sees you, they understand that you're committed, you're not there just, you know, for the moment, but you truly care and wants to work with them to bring solution, then I think they'll come on board. But it's a process um, and definitely we'll welcome some suggestions as to how best we can do this work because we have to do it together. Uh, we, we, it, it has, we have to do it together. I think COVID taught us that. Uh, we, you know, we got to do it together. I understand. Thank you. You're Thank you. Uh, next, we have a question from Carla Asdale Bragg. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning. So I am the director of marketing and community relations for the Cornell Scott Hill Health Center. And last year I embarked in a collaboration with uh, several uh, black female organizations to support a campaign on maternity health in particular black maternity health. And to or educate myself before we put the campaign together, I began to look at data and what was surprising to me is that the data was really not what I thought to be current data. And so my question to you is, you know, what is current data as we look at statistics? It, Cause I was thinking it would be within the last five years and it really was not. Okay, the, I mean, the, so you've given me homework to do. I, <laughs> off the top of my head, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you what the statistics is, but we're fortunate enough to work with uh, Natasha Ray, so we'll check with her shop, and we also use resources at Yale, and uh, maybe drop your uh, email or contact uh, Lane, and we'll 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 we'll, we'll work with you to try and get those uh, information because I mean the work you're trying to do with the different uh, women's organization, I think it's very important. So uh, let's get together and figure it out. Uh, it would be wrong on my part to try and come up with numbers. Uh, yeah. No, I understand, and and I you too. I just was wondering, you know, is how long does it really take to gather and then put it out? Is it usually like every 10 years or five years or whatever? But I will definitely, and I'm very connected. I work very strongly with Maurice. I know Natasha mm -hmm. as well, and I'm a collaborator with them as well. Okay. Um, I, I'm sure we'll meet soon. <laughs> right. Thank you. Yeah, uh, but, but some of these data, sometimes it's always a lag time. Maybe mm -hmm. not five years, sometimes it's one or two years or three years because they go through data cleaning and everything else. And when they release it, they want to make sure it's authentic. So sometimes there's always a lag time, but when it's over five, 10 years, then you know, maybe you just didn't have access to the most current data. So we'll figure it out again. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions or comments? We welcome anything that we could be doing to, to improve on what we shared with you or insights. We do have some great uh, contact information in the chat, Jose. They put his email there, but Maurice dropped his um, email and Lane also uh, in the office um, dropped his email address. So I encourage you to reach out if you have any additional questions or comments. Uh, as you can see, uh, Dr. Southpond's office is all about community connections and there's some great people on the team, including Maurice who I've known since he was like at least half as tall, not, <laughs> not like 10 feet tall. Yeah. Um, but uh, I encourage you to reach out. Thank you all so much for joining us this month. 
And we hope to see you at our next community breakfast um, on the first Thursday of October. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.